Okay, so it's about two o'clock. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Lauren Manier and I am a program associate with the Inclusive STEM Ecosystems for Equity and Diversity or ICEED program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I work on the AAAS IUS initiative. We are pleased to be hosting this workshop titled Responses to COVID-19, Adapting Classroom Teaching Techniques and Hands-on Learning to an Online Environment. And we are excited to hear from our presenters today, uh, Dr. Ch Rebecca Campbell Montalvo and Dr. Chaya Goplin. So before we jump into the presentation, and um, I have a few housekeeping notes. This presentation is being recorded and live streamed and the recording and the slides will be made available in the coming weeks on our website at AAAS-IUS.org. You will also receive an email uh, with a link to these materials when they're available. Uh, we will have time to transition into breakout room discussion groups following the presentations. And these breakout rooms will allow for a deeper engagement and they will not be recorded or live streamed. We also have closed captioning for this workshop. So if you're in the Zoom meeting with us, you can download and view the full transcript by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Now, before we turn it over to our presenters, I wanted to provide a little background about AAAS and the AAAS IUS initiative. Uh, AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, was founded in 1848 and is an international nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing science, engineering, and innovation to benefit all people. With the specific goals of strengthening and diversifying the STEM uh, science and technology workforce and fostering education in science and technology for everyone. With more than 120,000 individual members in more than 91 countries, AAAS is the world's largest multidisciplinary science society and a leading publisher of cutting edge research through the science family of journals. More information is available at AAAS.org. And the AAAS Improving Undergraduate STEM Education Initiative, or IUS Initiative, seeks to support faculty, students, and the greater undergraduate STEM education community by disseminating research and knowledge about STEM teaching, learning, equity, and institutional transformation. This year, we launched a website, blog, and workshop series. Today is our first of six such workshops we'll be hosting this year. Um, on our website, you can also find a collection of resources relating to improving undergraduate STEM education and an IUS proposal preparation toolkit for those interested in applying for an NSF IUS grant. We invite you to learn more about the AAAS IUS initiative on our website or LinkedIn page, and we hope that you will join our community as future contributors. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at IUS Program to stay up to date on our latest events, blogs, or to share what you've learned today at this workshop. So now I would like to turn it over to our first presenter, Dr. Rebecca Campbell Montalvo. Hello, good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, well, today I'm here to talk with you about our research and our project. Um, so the title of our talk is Addressing Interruptions in Applied STEM Environments Due to Rapid Social Change. So I think the title suggests that what we're gonna talk about today has implications outside of pandemic related disruptions, such as those caused, for example, by Hurricane Maria. The subtitle is how ECOR pivoted to continue service learning during COVID-19. So we're taking this example of what's going on now to talk about this. So again, my name is Rebecca Kimball Montalvo. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Connecticut. I'm an applied anthropologist, which means that I study humanity, specifically culture and institutions. And 
work with stakeholders to identify problems and create solutions. I would love to hear from anybody via email, rebecca.campbell at uconn.edu or Twitter. So please feel free to reach out. So let me get started first by telling everyone a little bit about ECOR. Um, so when I explain some of the obstacles we encountered and how the instructors pivoted during COVID, um, it can make some more sense. So ECOR or Environment Core is an interdisciplinary program at University of Connecticut. So basically we cross boundaries with the various disciplines um, and attempt to have, uh, we, we attempt to address multiple goals. Some of those include here at the bottom, helping the local municipalities address their environmental concerns. So working with them, having students do ser service learning, having instructors working along as well, guiding them to uh, fill local STEM capacity gaps. Some municipalities may lack monies, technical knowledge, various capital. Um, and so our program is one way that, you know, can help these concerns. Uh, but of course it gives valuable learning opportunities to our students and helps train the next generation of STEM professionals. So we have right now three courses, climate change, brownfields course and stormwater. Each course goes over two semesters. Uh, the first is more of like a, a knowledge base where the second is generally more applied project based. Um, and each course is taught by two or three faculty. Now we have uh, ha been going on through ECOR for a few years, we're actually in the second year of our NSF IU's grant, although the project had existed for a couple of years earlier due to some internal funding. So what have we done so far? Well, we've enrolled uh, more than, you know, close to 300 students from again, a variety of majors. Um, and you can see to the right here, a map of Connecticut with some of the local areas highlighted showing where some of our projects are. Um, in fact, these projects have been in over 60 towns um, resulting in about almost 80 projects. So the projects that the students do, um, their various reports and deliverables, including um, drafting um, environmental protection agency uh, proposal applications, grant proposals. And so far, these students have, uh, these projects have yielded over a million dollars in, in grant funded uh, work that help the towns clean up. But also, um, you know, the, the courses, then the students, the deliverables include things like, um, like a technical report, almost a report that you might get from a consultant that really would cost a, lo a lot of money to have, you know, a consultant come in and do that. So there's a big, certainly applied element here, as you can see through the service learning work. Now, um, you can learn more about eCorp at the link below, but I wanna just take a quick moment to say, you know, today I'm gonna be talking to you about how the eCorp program pivoted, but really that was made possible because part of our project and grant has a research component so that we can better understand service learning um, how might ECOR model be translated to other universities? How was it implemented here? So we um, purposively rebudgeted and pivoted our research efforts as well because we were undergoing, you know, the pandemic related effects just as all educational programs were in the US. So, so these findings here that I'm gonna talk about and these tips, um, you know, are a result of, you know, specifically focused research on the topic. So I'll frame the discussion today around this, this research approach. And so basically we can see these two research questions that guided um, our inquiry. And the first is how was teaching and learning in ECOR affected by the pandemic? What obstacles did it present? And then secondly, how did instructors pivot to address these obstacles? What kind of pedagogical changes did they make? What what things did they keep doing that worked well online? So the data sources for this inquiry include the observations and interviews that um, we had actually been conducting anyway as part of the normal scope of the project. Um, so those include like faculty meetings that the ECOR uh, instructors have with each other and some other stakeholders, um, as well as interviews every semester. I interview the faculty and as well as students. 
Um, so you can see here, um, you know, I did multiple rounds of interviews with the faculty. Um, so the, you can see that this is a data source that I, I, uh, our team looked at. And we use thematic analysis to make sense of our findings. And so basically thematic analysis is a qualitative uh, analytical method that helps you understand themes in qualitative data. And so those themes or patterns or, or key information relating to the research question become the findings. And so that's what I'm gonna to present to you today and, and discuss. So in terms of how did COVID affect teaching and learning at ECOR? Well, there was some obstacles that tended to appear again and again in the discourse or the talk of instructors, students during meetings, during interviews. And the first one dealt with interpersonal obstacles. So those are um, obstacles that have to deal with how students get along with each other or interact with others or engage or interact with professors. So one of the things that students and faculty both mentioned is, is because there was the shift to online learning and it was an inv involuntary shift. Certainly online learning is, is very valuable and many people, there's, so, there's a lot of benefits for it. It's a great mode for many students. But as we all know, in so many cases, this, this shift in spring of 2020 was one involuntary. So a lot of folks weren't necessarily wanting to go online. So what we found is that students and professors highlighted the move to online um, created an obstacle of teaching and learning because it inhibited relationship building. And that um, not only relationship building between you know, professors, students, students with each other, but also limited how students could interact with like guest speakers in class or um, you know, when an instructor circulates the room and you know, has one-on-one -on -one chats with students or in their small groups or looks at their paper and, they ask a question and there's a conversation. So it's this space where um, there's opportunity for um, you know, rapport to be built and things like that. And, and so just some examples from the interviews, and again, this was a major theme, you know, students said we miss building relationships with in instructors. A Brownfield instructor talked about how in the past when guest speakers would come and these are local professionals, um, engineers and, and the like doing this work, then in the past after the discussion, student, you know, a handful of students every time, you know, a number of students would go up to the podium, have an informal conversation with the, with the uh, guest speaker. And that provided actually a lot of opportunity for in, informal knowledge sharing. And um, so just uh, throughout the data, several examples of how, um, you know, it, it impacted, like I said, instructor feedback and things like that. But also the move to online also impacted interpersonal um, dynamics through students' ability to connect in group work, um, whether it was, you know, wrangling everybody, as this Brownfield student said, to get on the computer at the same time, right? That everybody had a different life. And um, as I'll say in a moment, when talking about the personal obstacles, um, group work and any type of work done was now being done in um, uh, this context of students now being moved to home, right? And having all these other uh, struggles of um, this, this new way of, of uh, learning. So making relationships with others, working in group work, these were some obstacles that we found. But we also found that um, not only were there interpersonal obstacles, but there were individual or personal obstacles. Um, and, and this is kind of what I was starting to touch on that um, learning online became a task in and of itself. Like this climate student said, it made everything feel like homework. If I was on campus, I wouldn't mind be, being in class or think of it. And as another climate student said, now, you know, going to class online, you've got to clear everything, your desk, your computer, make sure your connections are good. You really got to focus on lecture. So that's kind of like the first point, right? Of, okay, uh, now my attitude towards learning is, it seems like it's more of an effort, right? But then again, it's scaffolded on that more, okay, I'm not in, on campus, I'm at home. And how is my internet connectivity? And am I going to be having someone in my household coming in during lecture? Um, what if I, uh, you know, have to do household work? Uh, we also had, as the, the next kind of bullet suggests, students dealing with, you know, COVID themselves or taking care of somebody that had COVID. 
So you've got this, you know, trying to learn online in the home is difficult, but then also having this, as the second student here says, this added layer of chaos. So making it harder to focus. So in addition to interpersonal and personal obstacles, there was also obstacles related to stay at home orders or public building closures, um, which in the past students and faculty, you know, that was a big part of our, our, our courses and, and it is to a, continues of course, but um, you know, not being able to visit field sites to learn about communities really makes it hard to make an applied project that's gonna be what the communities want. And um, so students and instructors, as you can see here, they talked about not feeling as connected to the projects, missing out on really important community information like the student mentioning, well, we were supposed to go to the marina and we were gonna talk about, you know, the woman was gonna show the student, uh, you know, where the areas that tend to flood um, in a rainstorm and, and things like that. Um, so really missing out on knowledge to, to make the projects better. So the building closures impacted community relations, as I noted. But not only did it impact community relations um, and you know, the important information needed to do this project in the community level, but it also impacted students' abilities to access um, important information that they needed to do the projects well, including like government maps, right? So for instance, going to the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection file room, right? And, and that was mentioned uh, several times by different folks that well, you know, I would go to, normally you would go to town hall or go to whatever file room and get various, you know, uh, uh, maps and other things that are not digitally available. They're not available online. So both students and instructors mentioned um, that as an obstacle. And lastly, um, you know, building closures also impacted teaching and learning because, um, you know, the, you weren't able to use the computer labs on campus. So not only was this, tricky because a lot of the programs used in uh, STEM education, as we know, require a lot of um, memory, RAM, access, computing power. And so first of all, if you have a slower laptop, you know, which, you know, what many students can afford, it becomes very difficult to run those huge programs. But if you can go on campus to the computer lab, you can really use a high powered computer and make those calculations and maps that you need. So, um, Having a slower computer is difficult, as a student mentioned. You know, they were able to use some of the software that they need that's only available on campus by using a anywhere software portal. But the problem was is that their laptop didn't have the same power as the desktops on campus, and so it was difficult. And further, some programs like GIS, you know, you gotta have you have to have Windows or a PC for that to work. And so, what are students doing who are at home with Mac? How are they accessing this? So we did see, you know, multiple obstacles related to the building closures. So what did, what did our instructors do about it? Well, one thing to say about this is like everybody, in the beginning of the pandemic, so for thinking spring 2020, there was this kind of um, idea that this may not be long lasting, right? Oh, we'll flatten the curve, we'll take this two weeks lockdown, things will get better. Um, but, uh, and so what I saw in student interviews and meeting comments and instructor discourse was, um, you know, kind of how are we being responsive to being forced to move online in spring 2020? And so it was very more, much more reactive, okay? Um, but then as summer came, summer 2020 came, and we, we as a you know, society are all realizing, okay, this is really here for a very long term. Um, you could start to see like a change in the orientation of our stakeholders, you know, our professors, even students, um, but professors talking about how, you know, they were being purposive, having discussions about their strategies for planning. So that's kind of the first pivot is just recognizing, okay, I've got to do something different. And what am I going to do different? Why? What might work? Um, but I think another thing that I saw going on was accepting that there was some things lost, at least initially, um, you know, oh, I tried this and um, it, we were successful in this objective, but other things, you know, maybe not as good. But what I noticed is that over time, and that's the great thing about this longitudinal study is I was able to compare um, what people were saying, especially the professors each semester. 
and, and throughout the meetings that we would have four times a year. And after, when we're getting now into the fall 2021, really people were starting to say, it's going better, students are used to it, I've found this solution, the professors are sharing tips that are working, and really the quality and, and teaching and learning was really um, going, starting to go very well. So what made it go very well? What were some of these pivots? Well, having the course centered around an applied project, the deliverable, right? The EPA grant proposal, the consultant report, this, so on and so forth. And as a Brownfield instructor noted, the project, the course is community driven. There's a deliverable, a deadline, a framework. Students feel the town looks for their work. You know, students and instructors talked about the town appreciating what they did. And so there was like this reciprocity um, that made the students, you know, invested. And so having the course centered around these outcomes really helped both the instructors and students keep on task, continue working and things like that. Um, but what I will also add is that in all of these pivots, having a little more structure than you might normally have seemed to really benefit the online context. So for instance, a climate instructor shared, you know, having like a general scope of work. So when the student is doing the service learning, what exactly is the town looking for? What exactly will the student do coming to an agreement? And that kind of just helped make sure that the projects were really gonna benefit the town. Um, as well, you know, when we're talking about um, learning online via WebEx, things like that, um, you know, students talked uh, often about it being hard to focus. If you don't have your camera on, um, it can be really hard to focus with that chaotic background we just mentioned. And so in order to keep students engaged, um, some of the instructors talked about how they did that, such as, you know, having periodic questions in chat, having um, like short quizzes after, uh, you know, a couple questions just to make sure that the learning had taken place. And also because of everything going on, instructors found that explaining things more than once verbally, you know, having it written down, asking if there's questions about it, having rubrics multiple times really helped people be on the same page. So something else to think about. Another pivot that was successful was actually changing the structure of environments or the format. So uh, what I saw is a lot of instructors, instead of having midterm exams change to a project. So climate uh, instructors have this great project where normally they would have a midterm, but in order to determine you know, to allow the students to demonstrate their mastery of the knowledge, um, the instructors ask them uh, to, to hypothetically, it's the year 2050, and you see I'm reading now up here. There's been a climate event, some sort of event. Explain the event. What were the impacts, the solution? Pick anywhere, anytime. And so the idea here was that, yes, it's 2050, and what you're doing is you're designing a plaque, like a commemorative plaque. Like here is when X event happened and what happened and who it affected and how it was resolved. So it's kind of asking the students, you know, the event, you know, what was the cause? And so they were looking at, you know, what's going on in the environment now and how it would be changing in the future, um, you know, in order to make guesses about some things that, you know, are likely to happen and then some ways that can be remediated. Um, another way that the instructors pivoted again with changing assignments and things like that. If we go back to the example of the students not being able to access the file room, um, for this Brownfields course, what the students and the instructor ended up doing was um, instead of, um, not only were the students not able to go to the file, they also couldn't visit the sites. And so in order to determine if something is a Brownfield, it's really hard to do it if you can't look at it in person. What the students ended up doing with the guidance of the instructor was doing what they could do online, Google Maps, GIS, and really the outcome was fantastic because not only were the students able to give a list of local brownfields that then the town ended up kind of using to put in their proposal and identify as priority sites, but the students developed a methodology to use online mapping to, to identify uh, brownfields um, so a lot of positive outcomes. Also thinking about, you know, these pivots, what can be done virtually? So something that students talked about a lot that they loved was when professors did like tours, like field trips 
hosted by the professor. They might live stream them. They might audio record ahead of time. And students just loved those um, tours, which normally you, know, you would do in person. And interestingly, what professors also found is that the move to online for some components actually expanded participation. Like I'll show you a picture. Um, at the end of most of the courses, the students will present uh, their projects. And what professors found is that they were getting more people in attendance at those presentations. And in fact, they were getting people from the local municipalities, local government, that they may have not had access you know, to go on campus to a meeting in the past. So there was actually some um, you know, unforeseen benefits uh, to these uh, pivots. And lastly, one of the most important pivots was changing well, not that there was not a culture of support before, but really just reiterating, consistently being understanding and available to students. That was such a common thing that the students talked about. For example, they're very available through email, willing to meet after class, um, you know, still having a classes discussion, maintaining that structure, being as understanding as they could, letting them know we could talk to them. And even having um, small groups still online with meeting times during the scheduled class time. And that was one way to address that obstacle I mentioned before when the students were talking about having difficulty wrangling everyone's schedule. Well, if you do it you know, during the official class time, that's one way to make sure everyone's available. So there was this initial period of shock and evaluation, like I mentioned, when um, you know, we were first being reactive in spring 2020 and then realizing this is not temporary. So this adjustment of, okay, how am I gonna start planning? So in some, these obstacles were interpersonal, personal, result of building closures. So instructors really amplified the things that worked previously well, like having the course centered around projects. So they continued that, continued that additional structure. They changed assignments, right, from a midterm to a project, modified activities for virtual teaching. So like the field trips, they created that real culture of support so analysis did show that participants felt that the pivot was successful, but some elements may not translate well to online context. So something to keep in mind. You know, what are some takeaways you can take from this discussion? Well, what I've talked to you about is, you know, some pivots offer insight into how applied STEM serving learners, STEM service learning, you know, that we can adjust it in various circumstances beyond the pandemic, as I mentioned in the beginning. So what can you do in your classroom? Focus on sustaining relationships and being positive, being a little more lenient, you know, asking how people are, not requiring documentation if someone, you know, um, has some type of issue, uh, you know, just, you know, all constantly asking, do you have any questions? Centering on these applied projects, making practical adjustments, amplifying strategies that work well online. So we're writing up these findings in preparation for AERA open. So look for that. And we would love to hear from anybody interested in this. And so um, you can see on the bottom here, we have the PI's email address. And I'd just like to appreciate and acknowledge our uh, eCorp project team members. And also of course, NSF and our donors who support this work. And thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing from anybody about this work. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell Montalvo. Um, we are looking forward to having time to discuss your presentation in, in breakout rooms. But before that, um, I think we're going to turn it over to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Chaya Gopalan. Hello, I'm Chaya Gopalan. I'll be talking about responses to COVID-19 adapting classroom teaching techniques, and in particular, adapting flipped classroom teaching techniques during the pandemic. So what is flipped classroom? Uh, the definition goes this way, a teaching method where the first contact with the content occurs in an individual learning space, such as a student accessing the information from home or from the library, et cetera, and the application of content in an interactive guided group space, which could be the face-to-face -face classroom or uh, as it is currently a synchronous setting online. So this is where the 
content, the lecture content is shifted as homework and students are allowed to be exposed to the content on their own first. And then when they are in the classroom or in a synchronous setting, it is a student-centered classroom where students are in charge for asking questions on the content that was not clear to them and practicing the lecture content in the form of a, a Q and A session or another type of active learning activity that the instructor will provide, and also in the form of a peer interaction. So it is um, designed in such a way that there are two major components. One is uh, the pre-class component where the introduction of content happens remotely. And that could be in the form of readings, slides, lecture videos, study guide, etc. And an assessment of some form, it's a formative assessment, is important to make sure that the student does uh, work on the assigned content. And the second major component is the in-class activity. The lecture is gone, so the students are kept engaged in different ways. What are those different ways? Review of concepts in the form of a Q&A session, and then active learning activities, such as an individual assessment, polling would be one, or um, uh, a case discussion, team-based learning, etc. So that is the group activity that we're talking about. And then instant feedback is important to know, uh, you know how much they knew or uh, how much more they should be learning, et cetera. So the uh, individual assessment on their preparation can be done remotely or as part of the in-class activity. So having done this type of uh, design, this particular teaching heavily depends on Bloom's taxonomy, which organizes learning into different tiers. What we expect from students, this is in the pre-class setting, is to be prepared at the level of memorization or comprehension. The first two tiers, the blue tiers, and then during class or during a synchronous session is where the higher order learning is supposed to take place. Application, analysis, evaluation, and synthesis are the types of activities that are created during class time. So the IFLIP, that is Innovative Flipped Learning Instructional Project, the NSF funded project focused on training 24 STEM faculty members to be uh, familiar with flip teaching and then to implement flip teaching in their STEM classrooms. This involved two institutions. One is my uh, institution, Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, a public university in Edwardsville, Illinois. I call this as 4YI, meaning four-year institution. And then another institution is a two-year institution that is the local community college that is St. Louis Community College with four major campuses spread over a St. Louis metropolitan area. My amazing co-PIs, uh, Georgia Bracey, Julie Fickers, Sharon Locke, and uh, Lynn Bartels um, are also part of this project. The way it was designed was in 2018 fall, we recruited 12 uh, faculty members from the STEM disciplines, six from my institution, uh, six from the two-year institution. So that is called cohort one, and they received their training uh, in one semester, and they started implementing flip teaching in the subsequent semesters. And then in 2019, the same pattern was followed. Cohort two came in. They were mentored by cohort one. They also helped, cohort one also helped recruiting cohort two. This was all done uh, by the application process, selection process, and these participants are simply amazing. The research questions that we asked were how do faculty perceive and implement flipped teaching? What are their expectations? And um, 
um, how do faculty perceive the experience of implementing a flipped classroom on their own? And what kind of experiences of flipped teaching affect faculty attitude towards intention to use flipped teaching or self-efficacy in using student-centered teaching, all of those? How does faculty implementation of a flipped teaching at a four-year institution compare with that of a two-year community college? And uh, what are the essential design principles for implementing a successful flipped classroom at each type of institution? So those were the three questions we, we intended to answer. And the training uh, was spread over, this is flipped teaching faculty development training, spread over uh, an entire semester uh, bi-weekly and split between uh, the two institutions. And uh, then, um, the results that we found from this type of uh, design, this is all pre-COVID. So I'm going to organize the results into pre-COVID and during COVID, pre-COVID, it was mostly done by uh, cohort one because they had three semesters to, to implement a flip teaching in their STEM classrooms. So this is prior to training and this is cohort one. These are three semesters of implementation. Their flip teaching knowledge increased and stayed high throughout. And then self-efficacy you know, started off very high even you know, before the training and it was uh, that way throughout. And with cohort two, they did not have much time to implement. They only had one semester to implement and their knowledge before starting uh, jumped up with one semester of implementation. Same with the self-efficacy. It also went high with one semester of implementation. So in summary, flip teaching uh, is beneficial but require an adjustment period and that may delay a full successful implementation. Perceived barriers decreased over um, after repeated implementation. Participants were more comfortable implementing flip teaching after repeated years. Feedback grew increasingly positive after repeated implementation. So what we're learning is repeated uh, implementation is necessary to see the full benefit of a flip teaching. And what did the students have to say? Well, we collected data from 43 STEM classrooms, 21 classrooms from a four-year institution and 22 from the two-year institution, a total of 702 students were surveyed. And uh, this is broken down on a semester basis. The first um, data that you see is only from cohort one. And that's when four-year institution students uh, responded more positively for flip teaching compared to two-year institution students. Female students uh, found it again, more beneficial than the male uh, students. In um, fall 2019, again, cohort one, this is when the results were even between the two institutions. Flip teaching was uh, well received by both groups of students. Therefore, there was no significant difference. Spring 2020, that was right before uh, COVID-19, uh, both cohorts one and two implemented flip teaching. This is where we found an interesting um, finding that is juniors and seniors were more likely to report an overall favorable experience compared to freshmen and uh, sophomores. All right, now we all know that spring 2020, around spring break, COVID-19 happened. And so that's when the cohort one and cohort two, you already know one was uh, implementing for a long time, three semesters uh, at least, and then one semester of flipping for the second cohort and all classes were now shifted to an online setting. And we quickly added another research question how does flip teaching transition to remote instruction? So we needed to answer that. So we went ahead and uh, recruited uh, another, another uh, group of uh, faculty, faculty um, members from the STEM discipline. So did the design of flip teaching change? 
slightly. All right, so let me show you where it changed. The terminology pre-class was changed to asynchronous. That's it. And then uh, in class is now changed to synchronous. And then another minor change is the active learning session that's supposed to happen uh, in a synchronous setting is where we started using clickers instead of a paper copy of a problem set, uh, breakout rooms for group activities. Those are the minor changes we had to make for uh, remote learning. Otherwise, the, the major components stayed the same. All right, so now we recruited a new uh, group of STEM faculty. These are uh, STEM faculty members that had absolutely no idea about flip teaching. We call them as traditional uh, teaching educators. You already are familiar with the the flip teaching uh, participants design cohort one, cohort two. I'm only going to talk about the traditional teaching educators, the newly recruited STEM faculty. We recruited nine uh, faculty members from the two-year institution, nine from the four-year institution. And we, we also broke down the courses they taught. They covered all areas of uh, the STEM discipline. This is traditional teaching educators and uh, flipped teaching educators, uh, very uh, well diversified. So uh, when a survey was conducted between the two groups, the first question we asked was, how much online experience did you have prior to flip teaching? That's where we noted that the flip teaching educators naturally had a um, more online teaching experience that is even before they joined the flip teaching community. And then we asked uh, what format of online teaching did you pick during COVID-19? Then it was interesting, two thirds of the faculty, whether they were uh, flip teachers or the traditional teachers all picked asynchronous. One third, however, uh, still stayed with the synchronous method. And then we said, you know, how confident were you in carrying your teaching responsibilities in an online format? And this is where uh, the flip teaching educators were more confident. It was significantly different from the traditional teaching faculty. And then this is up applicable only to the flip teaching educators. We asked, did the resources that you used in flip teaching help you as you transition to online teaching. And as you can tell, it was either useful or very useful. The pre-class content was all very useful. In-class activities, not so much. Well, we need to keep in mind that two third of the faculty had already used um, the asynchronous method. So they didn't have a lot of in-class activity to carry out. So overall, it was either useful or very useful is what they were telling us. So there was more uh, uh, comment, etc. here. A two-year uh, institution faculty rated the benefits of, of having pre-class assignment higher than their counterparts, meaning they appreciated the the resources they had even more. The training in preparing resources for flipped teaching was very helpful is what they said. And many of the active learning activities that were planned for the in-class activity could easily be, be converted to a, a remote setting. So those were all very positive. However, there were also some challenges. The three challenges that we noted mainly were uh, switching to online labs. That was difficult. And then ensuring student engagement in an online environment was also a challenge. And then the assessment of student knowledge and skills, basically conducting exams in a supervised manner was not as easy. What did the students have to say during this transition from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to online teaching? Well, here what we did was to divide the students uh, from cohort one's class and cohort two class. Remember, cohort one had more experience than cohort two. And you notice that 
uh, cohort one students were um, very confident, they transitioned more easily, they adjusted to online teaching more easily compared to cohort two. So what we found out pre-COVID that is repetition and repeated use of flipped teaching is beneficial and that's what was needed for cohort two to see the same type of uh, changes. And uh, um, who adjusted more easily is another thing we checked. And the asynchronous group shown in blue, they adjusted to online course easily because they didn't have to structure their class time, et cetera. They transitioned easily when it was offered in an asynchronous manner. And then male students were more confident than female students in completing the course successfully. So those are some um, results that we have. And students also said they didn't have to ma make a much uh, more adjustment because they were already used to flip teaching and they already had an established routine. Expectations were clearly laid out and the ability to continue to learn at their own pace uh, with the added accountability uh, to meet goals each week. And they appreciated the instructor presence and they appreciated the communication that was happening between the instructor and the students. Students had many challenges, we must note. Uh, they were overwhelmed with the number of emails, due dates, overall stress of taking a full load of classes online. Um, home life distraction, students moving from campus to home and a lot of distraction there. Internet accessibility was a challenge. Uh, technology was in general a challenge. Lack of motivation was another serious concern we noted. All right, so that's that. And in conclusion, what we would say is yes, flip teaching provided effective preparation for faculty and students for online instruction at both institutions. Flip teaching can be effectively adapted to online instruction, preserving some aspects of active learning. I must thank uh, a number of people here, my uh, co-PIs, Drs. Lynn Bartels, Georgia Bracey, Julie Fickers, and Sharon Lark, uh, our statistician, Dr. Carolyn Butzmeier, and uh, my uh, graduate assistants, Hannah, Paige, and Carlos and all of the participants in our study and their students. Uh, questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopalan. Um, I think we're going to move into breakout room discussions um, so we can talk with um, each other. So uh, thank you to those who joined us um, via live stream and we are going to transition into breakout rooms. Let me share my slides quickly. So um, breakout rooms are going to be self-assigned by topic and last name. To enter the breakout room, please navigate to the bottom of your screen to the breakout rooms button and click the room you'd like to enter. And if you're interested in speaking with Rebecca Campbell Montalvo's team, select the group labeled ECOR and then your corresponding last name. And if you're interested in discussing with Chaya Gopalan's team, uh, select one of the groups labeled flipped classroom according to the first letter of your last name. If you don't see the breakout rooms option at the bottom of your screen, um, just hang tight and we will assign you to a room and um, all of the rooms have facilitators. So if you arrive before your facilitator, free, feel free to start introducing yourselves and discussing until your facilitator gets to the room. Um, and we will call you back to the large group at 3.25 p.m. Eastern time. Have a productive discussion. Um, welcome back, everyone. We're going to give everyone a few seconds to join back into the large group. Okay, I think I think everyone's back in. Um, so I'm wondering if we can get um, our facilitators to kind of share back what the main talking, um, what you mainly talked about in your discussion. So let's start with our facilitators. Um, Todd, would you like to go first? Yes, uh, I'll do my best to summarize the great conversations. I appreciate everyone in our group. Uh, we, we talked about the different kinds of applied STEM programming, 
that uh, people were involved in and that had to pivot as a result of the pandemic. So some of those are um, high school math teacher placements, uh, um, some research, undergraduate research experiences, community colleges connected to uh, four-year institutions in Arizona, um, how those had, how those are focused on engaging students in con consequential pursuits, um, STEM bridge programs in the summer where you're supporting uh, underserved, underrepresented students to have, have positive launches early on in their undergraduate careers. Um, yeah, so those were the programs. I probably missed some, uh, there are quite a range. And then we just visited about some of the obstacles that those programs faced. Um, disproportionate impact on communities. So some people might have the space to study in quiet places and, and, and have access to internet and devices, um, but others might not, and we just don't know that. So that was something that we needed to take into account and flexibility and expectations played a role in that. And then some benefits is might, uh, some mentioned some attitudes towards online learning might have been shifted because uh, they, they, they had to sample what online instruction could do and maybe found some affordances as part of that. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a great discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, Marissa, would you like to share what your group talked about? Sure. So we actually uh, talked more about the flipped classroom and less about the e-core, uh, which, you know, is, is, is totally fine because th those, you know, everything became about the, the flipped classroom uh, this year. And so we talked about uh, two main topics. Uh, the first one uh, was the, the topic of uh, cheating in this online environment and how, what are different strategies, you know, to deal with that. You know, uh, we know that uh, a lot of the times this does become an equity issue, you know, because some students have access to paid services that provide the solutions to things. And so we discussed different strategies um, to deal with that. And so uh, some institutions use the, the lockdown response monitor, some other institutions do not want to engage with that because of privacy issues. Um, but then, you know, one uh, good strategy uh, that one of the colleagues brought up was kind of like splitting down uh, the, the grade into many kinds of assignments and different types of assignments uh, for like different learn different uh, uh, types of learners um, doing project based uh, exams um, and relying less on like the standardized you know problems having multiple types multiple times of exams for the same cohort so there is a variety of things you know that one can do uh, to deal with this the second uh, the second portion you know that we discussed was engaging students in the online environment and so strategies for that you know specifically like breaking uh, students into smaller groups um, and breakout sessions in which they work on specific things. We talked about the need for structure in an online environment, you know, and how to provide that. The use of different tools, you know, like software and online tools to engage students so that, you know, we basically get the further away we are from lecturing and, you know, the closer we are in actually an applied STEM environment and problem-based learning, the, you know, the better it is for student engagement in, in, in this environment. And so that was more or less the, the discussion. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing back. Um, and then quickly turning to the flipped classroom discussions, um, Myron, would you like to share what your group discussed? Sure, yes, in addition to some of the things that Marissa uh, list, listed there, uh, we talked about the challenges of pivoting to the online environment um, quickly in the spring. So a, a lot of those things came up during the discussion. Um, it was very challenging for faculty members, but once they were able to get materials online, then um, they adapted, adapted greatly. And the biggest issue other than that was student engagement and finding ways to do uh, labs online. And so some of the um, ways that people brought up uh, for putting labs online, including videotaping the labs, sending out kits and letting students do the labs at home themselves while you watch them on Zoom. So I thought some of those things were very innovative, but um, the biggest issue, that was the biggest gist of our discussion. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Thomas, uh, what did your group discuss with the flipped classrooms? So we talked a lot about um, challenges with uh, students in co uh, during COVID. Uh, many of the students, I don't think would be shocked to know, didn't want to do online work. Uh, they waited too long to get their online work done. We talked about the fact that 
Um, one of the ways to get around this is to give them a lot of examples and explicit instructions, um, and then be more consumer oriented. I really like that. So that we would say, how can I help you and keep a very positive sort of a uh, happy tone during the lectures and the work. Um, we had weekly deliverables, uh, course uh, frequently asked question type things, cliff notes, self checks. Um, there were a lot of issues with technology and sometimes they weren't clearly real issues. I, I could quickly learn from students uh, what were real issues and what were maybe trying to get a little bit more time to study issues. Um, motivation was lacking and just being really flexible, I think, overall. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and I want to end with our speakers. Um, Rebecca, what did your group discuss? Well, uh, we had um, great discussion uh, with a couple of uh, professors, you know, teaching various STEM disciplines, you know, physics, microbiology. Um, talking about the approaches they use to bring the lab experience home, um, you know, talked about, you know, having like virtual labs where someone goes in and records themselves and then, and then giving the students the data. <clears throat> that wasn't as productive as, um, you know, being able to <clears throat> have students use like Baker's yeast and, and create, um, you know, experiments at home or, or sending kits kits home that allow the students to build hardware. And of course, we talked about the monetary, um, you know, that's very expensive. What if you, you or your college or student, you know, don't have those funds. Um, we also talked about, um, you know, being forgiving like some of the other groups did. Um, and whereas maybe in the past, um, we might have required documentation for certain things, absences, um, but now, you know, we can see, the flexibility is just so much more important now. And, um, and, I, and one thing to just kind of close on um, is that, you know, in our society, you might, you know, oppressed groups, minoritized groups may disproportionately experience certain life events that require this grace and, and um, flexibility by professors. So I think, you know, me just kind of adding, supplementing that I think flexibility is like a diversity issue and equity and inclusion issue as well. So a uh, great discussion talking about how uh, the courses in our discussion pivoted themselves. Mm -hmm. Great and very great point. Um, Chaya. Yes, uh, we had a great uh, discussion. First, the participants in the breakout room had some follow-up questions to my talk such as, you know, was there any difference uh, between students of uh, different ethnicity, you know, different uh, uh, levels of um, experience, like freshman to senior. So that was all um, answered. And then the challenges uh, that, that during transition was brought up, especially during COVID. Uh, the engagement of uh, students has been one of the major issues. Uh, assessments is the other one. And then um, faculty training, lack of faculty training, and how you know, we expect them to be going and doing online teaching suddenly, more assistance needed. Technology was a big issue in every, every way. Um, then the solutions that um, they were able to find. A number of solutions were shared. First of all, being flexible with the due dates and then um, shifting to project-based assessment versus exams. And then um, there is another cool uh, system, learning assistant program where the university will provide a person to uh, manage the chat function and uh, take notes and share with the professor later so that you know the students frustrations can be conveyed uh, to make the necessary adjustments. Uh, Microsoft Jamboard was uh, brought up, Microsoft Edge, OneNote. So those were uh, uh, quite a few suggestions that they shared. Uh, yeah. That's, that was uh, my group discussion. Awesome, thank you so much. And it sounds like there was some kind of recurring topics throughout the discussions among 
um, all six groups. So uh, before we go, I just wanted to thank our speakers and facilitators, as well as the rest of the AAAS IUS team and all of you who were able to join and participate in the workshop. We do have a post-event survey link, which we are posting in the chat and we'll send out by email. Um, additionally, the recording will be available in the coming weeks. And we thank you for joining us today and we look forward to engaging with and learning from you, our AAAS IUS community. So thanks everyone.